Before we uh, call our brother Jed to come forward for his second class, we're going to have a reading. It's going to ta be taken from 2 Samuel 7, verses 1 through 17. The second class is titled, He Shall Build an House for My Name. And again, the reading, 2 Samuel 7, verses 1 through 17. <clears throat> And it came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said unto the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build, why build ye not me in house of cedar? Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep goat, from following the sheep, to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. We'll be pleased to call our brother Jed forward to give us his second class this morning. Well, brothers and sisters and young people, we continue following the ark as it has left the wicked place that had developed in Shiloh and has wandered through the lands of the Philistines and of some of the Israelites. It now resides in the house of Abinadab. And as I said at the close of the last class, there are those who, though physically did not follow the ark, their hearts sought it, and they yearned to see it, and they yearned to see it put in a place of honor and rest. And David himself falls into that category, though likely he had never known a tabernacle that had the ark in it. 
As I said, there, was, there is some trouble with the timeline, trying to decipher exactly how long the Ark was at uh, Abinadab's house, or how long the Ark had gone, uh, how long it had been between the Ark leaving Shiloh and uh, coming in to the tent that David pitched for it. The record says it was a long time, 20 years. Well, the, we know that the reign of Saul was 40 years. And it was, the ark in essence was in exile for that whole 40 years. And we know that David reigned for seven years in Hebron before he even took Jerusalem. And then there was a period where he could actually bring the ark to him. So that's 47 years minimum there that the ark was in exile. But the record says 20. So if anybody has any insight to that, I've tried to figure out how to reconcile those numeric problems and I have not succeeded yet. So if anyone has any insight to that, I'd really appreciate that. Um, suffice to say that the shepherd boy David, the captain of Saul's army, and eventually the King David, had this in his heart to build a house for Yahweh. And it's interesting that as, as you follow through the progress of David, as he becomes king, as he establishes himself in Judah, in Hebron, and as he eventually establishes himself over all Israel in Jerusalem, he seems to have a singular focus. He seems to be pushing towards something in all of his efforts. Uh, we know the, the mindset that he has developed through this, this time in his life, through the the failures and through the successes, seeing the hand of his God in his life, seeing, in, seeing the hand of God in Abigail coming to deter him from sinning and encouraging him to follow the path that God has set his feet on to be king in Israel. We see the hand of God keeping him away from Mount Gilboa, where his friend Jonathan would fall. And we see the hand of God establishing him as king over all Israel in Jerusalem. And David's heart is focused on the ark of his God. And so the progress of time as he goes through, he, he becomes king in Hebron, and for the next seven years engages on campaigns against the surrounding nations. He takes Jerusalem as soon as he becomes king over all Israel in Hebron, when all the tribes come down and make him king. He immediately goes up as far as, if you just read through Second Samuel, this is the, the, the pace that we have of David's life. He immediately goes up and takes Jerusalem. And it's by no means the first time he's been to this city. And then in the record, he, he takes Jerusalem, and then he goes to get the ark. How did he know that it had to be Jerusalem? No one else seemed to know this. Joshua didn't go and take Jebus and plant the tabernacle there and say, this is the place where God has chosen to place his name forever. He didn't seem to know it. Moses didn't tell us, go to the city of Jebus when you enter into the land, and that's where you will establish the place that Yahweh will meet with you. But David seemed to understand it. Hopefully as we go through our class, uh, just at, at the end here, as we... Um, move on to this next stage of the journey of the ark, we'll see how it is that David's mind had picked up on the coordinates, as it were, of where the temple was to be. So our reading from 2 Samuel 7 is a passage that we're so familiar with. The passage that tells us that we always um, turn to, to consider the promises made to David, the promise of the king and of the throne and of resurrection to David himself. Um, interesting side note, there are those versions out there, not that by any means the King James is inspired, but it is helpful, especially in this case, because there are those versions out there that eliminate the resurrection from the promises to David. And the passage that we had read in verse 16 of 2 Samuel 7, where it says, Thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee, is where we would always turn to to say the promise to David was a promise that he has to be resurrected to receive. Because thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. But we're told at the beginning of this in verse 13, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. So you won't see this begin to take place. But you'll see it when it's established forever. 
So he has to come back from the dead to see that. It will be established forever before thee. There are versions who change that verse to say, shall be established forever before me. To say God is going to see it, but David's already asleep with his fathers. So you can then interpret that to say that David is in heaven or some other form of, of um, doctrinal error to try to explain that passage. But we can put our confidence that David will be resurrected to see the fulfillment of these promises that he's given. But for our purposes, we want to, instead of looking at what we normally look at, at the far down the tunnel fulfillment for David when Jesus is established on his throne, on the throne of his father David, to look at these, um, these promises in the context directly related to David's son, to the son that would be chosen to build the house and to sit on his throne. And at the end of David's life, he's recorded as saying, God has given me many sons, but he has chosen Solomon to build a house for his name. So there's something in these passages, in these, these verses of promise, that specifically are to be applied to Solomon. Not every aspect, not certainly Solomon sitting on the throne of David when David is resurrected, but the primary aspects of the building of the house, of the establishing of the kingdom, the establishment of the throne, are to see their type established in Solomon before the reality arrives in Christ. So just reading through some of these verses again, uh, verses 8 to 11 of 2 Samuel 7, um, after the initial part is, is it laying down the, the heartfelt desire of King David to do this, He's, he has, in a sense, fulfilled his desire and he's brought the ark into Jerusalem and he's established a tent of meeting around it. There's an altar before it. And he sits in his house, which is made out of timbers of cedar brought from Hiram, king of Tyre, a gorgeous house. And he says, I'm not done yet. This isn't right. I shouldn't be elevated higher than the throne of my God and the throne of my king. This isn't done yet. It's... I thought this was all I had to do, but I have to do more. This isn't right that I am elevated and the, the presence, the ark of the presence of my God dwells behind curtains. So, of course, we know the, the response of God when he says, I wish to do this. The eventual response of God is you will not do this. And here's what I have to say to you about the matter, David. Verse 8. Now therefore, he's speaking to Nathan, Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee, whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. And we have that confirmed, because in verse 1 of 2 Samuel 7, it says, Yahweh had given him rest round about from all his enemies. I have given thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. The nations are trembling before this emperor who sits in Jerusalem. Nobody can stand against him. No matter how many he sends out, he always wins. No matter what the battle looks like, he is always successful. And the nations have backed off. They're not coming to antagonize this man anymore. He has established himself as the power in the Middle East. And Yahweh has done that for him. He has given him rest from all his enemies round about. And he has given him a great name. Verse 10, moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them anymore as before time. So the benefits that I've given to you, David, I will give to my people Israel. And do you notice some of the, the, the similar characteristics of what is being promised to Israel, to what David desires to do for the Ark of the Covenant? He says in verse 10, I will appoint a place. Wasn't well, that David's desire to establish a place for the Ark of the Covenant, to build a permanent structure of place of rest for the Ark of the Covenant. And Yahweh says to him, I will do it for Israel. I will plant them. I will set them in a sure place that they may dwell in a place of their own. 
And isn't that the desire of David? Isn't that the desire of Yahweh himself to dwell with his people in his sanctuary? So there's an interesting connection that we could, that we could tease out a bit more given the time to see the relationship of the people of Israel to the Ark of the Covenant, but specifically to the cherubim, which we hope we'll deal with a bit more tomorrow afternoon at the gathering. But the representation that we're being shown here is the relationship between the people of Israel as God's people receiving the same benefits that David is seeking to do for the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God, that they are somewhat intertwined, that the, the dwelling of God in the midst of his people that David desires to see is the dwelling of the people in the presence of God that God desires to see. So we have two, two different individuals with different perspectives of the matter, but with the same goal in mind. David desires to see God dwell with his people, and God desires to see his people dwell with him. Verse 11, we read that as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also Yahweh telleth thee that he will make thee in house. So the, that first part of verse 11, he's telling David, I never asked anyone to build me a house. He, he says it in a different way in, in other ways as well. Um, earlier in the chapter, he says it, and in comparative records, he says it in a similar way. I have never asked anyone to do anything in, of this matter. So, in essence, he's asking, he's telling David, um, I, I haven't asked you to do this, but we know from a comparative account that he says it's good that it was in your heart to do this. Because you've seen that that's my intent. Through your own personal meditations upon my word, you've seen that it's my intent to have a permanent dwelling place with my people. And it's good that you desire to do that. But you're not the one to do it, David. And he, he as God is often wont to do, he completely flips the situation on its head. And instead of just telling David, no, 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 don't do that. Go back to conquering all the nations around you and I'll deal with your son about building the house. He tells David, you want to build me a house, I'm going to build you a house instead. And we, of course, look at that as the Davidic dynasty that's to come afterwards. Not a physical structure that David and his family were going to dwell in, but the dynasty of David upon the throne of Israel. And we are confident that there will not be an established throne of Israel without a descendant of David sitting upon it, because that is the promise of God. We have prime ministers, we have other forms of rulership that may take place, but to have a throne and a king of Israel, it will be a descendant of David. And the only one who can confidently claim that position is our Lord when he returns. But here we're talking about the next generation, immediately following David. Um, throughout the life of David, there were contests, there were disputes between the brethren, between his sons, um, on many different matters, uh, on who would be ruler, who would be king after him, after David, on so many other things um, of wickedness that occurred within his family. And we're being told here that God will pick one of them. It's not going to be up to you, David. It's not going to be up to your sons to decide who it is. It's not going to be a political decision. I'm going to pick the son that will do it. And we know that that son would be Solomon. So what is he actually going to do? Well, we know from verse 12 that it will not happen while David is alive. Can you imagine the sorrow that may have crept into David's heart? This is his deepest desire to build a house for his God. And God says, not only am I not going to allow you to do it, you're not even going to see it while you're alive. Because it's not going to start being constructed until you're asleep in the grave. How would that affect him? How would that change his perspective on things? How would that affect us? I can remember reading years ago a passage, I, I thought it was ingenious of discipleship, um, but I've read it about 20 times thinking I'm missing the passage and I'm, it's just not there. Um, but I remember the passage very clearly where the brother was trying to impart to the readers the concept of humility and submission. And he uses David as an example. And he says David is in the prime position to perform this work. He is 
as God says, the leader of his people. He has the, the power to go out and conquer any nation, to take whatever he needs. He has the power to command the people of Israel to do whatever needs to be done. And God tells him, you're not going to do it. He comes to God with a purpose, with an intent, with a, a project, and God says, that's a good project. But you're not the one to do it. How would we react to that? How would our own pride react to being told, that's a fantastic idea, yep, that's exactly what the Ecclesia should do, but he should do it, not you? Would we feel cast to the side? Would we feel like, well, if, if I'm not going to be able to do it, then I don't want the Ecclesia to do it at all. That's what the human nature wants to do. That's where we, we feel our umbrage, the brother says, and we want to take over. We want it to be our project, not the ecclesial project. Not the project of the people of God for his glory, but our project. And we don't see that in David. We see as, as the story unfolds throughout the next few chapters, we see David do exactly the opposite. We see in his prayer at the end of 2 Samuel 7, his awe at the mercy of God in not saying, yes, you can build the house, but in saying, I'm going to build you a house. God in his wisdom and his wisdom alone is able to completely flip David's perspective to his own perspective. And to say, the important thing here, David, is not the structure, though I do want that built. The important thing is having a dynasty of righteousness sitting upon my throne. And you're going to be the head of that dynasty. You're going to be the one from whom they all descend. And he, is, he seems to have absolutely no resentment over being told not to build the house. And we see as the story progresses that he engages in activities that make it quite easy for his successor to build the house. And so the, the brother whose article I read said, if we were to offer to the Ecclesia an opportunity to prepare a great study work on some essential topic of doctrine, and we bring it before the Ecclesia, and the Ecclesia says, you're right, that is definitely what we need right now. We really need to strengthen that aspect of our belief. Uh, but this brother over here would probably be a better one to do it. Would we take our piles of notes and our folders and all our materials and say, well, he can get his own stuff? Or would we say, wow, well, if he's going to do that, I'm going to do everything I can to give him everything he needs. Because this is what the Ecclesia needs. And even if I'm not the one to do it, the Ecclesia needs it. And that brother can benefit from all the work I've already done. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that brother succeeds. Because that's what David did. Yes, it was his own son. Yes, it was the first um, successor in the dynasty of David. But it was not to, to honor his own family. It was to honor his God. And that was where his heart was focused. That was what his desire was. So just to, to, to step back a bit before we go forward into 2 Samuel 8, um, I want to try to give you an idea as to how I think David knew where to build the temple. Um, to lay the context for um, how I came to this conclusion, when we're first introduced to David, he is in the field with the sheep. And we know through reading the Psalms that this was a time for him to meditate upon the word of God. That there wouldn't have been the ease of transport. He wouldn't have uh, thrown his backpack on and grabbed his iPod with all these classes in his ears and gone out to follow the sheep and listen to all these other expounders of the word. He had to memorize it and he had to think upon it himself. And David was a man of music. So what he would have had for scriptures at that time would likely have been simply the first five books of what we have in our Old Testament. There may have been some other writings that, that helped to understand these things, but he wouldn't have been able to just roll them up, stick them in his backpack, and take them out into the fields and read them while the sheep are grazing. It was very uncommon to have your own copy of the scriptures, so you had to memorize it. Even today, um, there are young children in Israel who from a very young age are taught the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and they can memorize it. They can memorize all the, the law of Moses from beginning to end. Five books of the Bible, they can recite it on command, chapter and verse, section and, and paragraph. 
So the ability is there if you're dedicated and focused. And I have no doubt that David had that ability. But as a musician, as someone who was incredibly skilled and able to impart comfort and meaning through his music to others, it's likely that he would have been specifically drawn to songs in the Old Testament, in the Torah. And if we're talking about his desire that was there from the beginning to find a place of rest for the Ark of the Covenant, I think that the song that would have been his meditation and his contemplation for many of those days and nights in the field would be the song of Moses in Exodus 15. And if we turn that up, I think I can show to you from some of the context of that chapter how it was that David was able to get a general coordinate location of where God had chosen to put his name. Exodus chapter 15, uh, we'll just read through, uh, we'll just pick out a few verses. Firstly, uh, beginning at the uh, verse 1, of course we know this is just after the Egyptians have been defeated when the Red Sea has closed in upon them and, and consumed them. So chapter 15, verse 1, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto Yahweh, and spake, saying, I will sing unto Yahweh, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. So right at the beginning, the response of those who are saved by the deliverance of Yahweh is, I will prepare him a habitation. I want him to dwell with me, and I will prepare a place for him to dwell with me. And of course, we have already looked at in our previous class, Exodus 25, verse 8, where God says, I want you to make a place for me to dwell with them. So Moses, as we would expect, is dead on with his purpose here in leading the nation of Israel in this song, stating that they will prepare a place for God to dwell with them. Well, where will that place be? As we move on through the song, the, the triumph of Yahweh is relayed as he has done these great works in the, the, the plagues and in the destruction of Egypt and the sea. We read in verse 13, Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. So I'm not saying that the other side of the Red Sea is where that holy habitation of of dwelling place was to be, but God is leading them there. So he says, thou hast led them as if it's already done. Thou hast guided them because he has delivered them in wisdom and strength from Egypt. And in Moses' eyes, it's as good as done now. The greatest trials are behind us. We're out of Egypt. We just have to follow God and he'll lead us to the place of his holy habitation. Now we get more specific. Verse 14, the people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina or the land of the Philistines. Now we know from other accounts that God specifically didn't take Israel through the land of the Philistines because he said the people are tender and they will see war and be afraid. So they wouldn't be afraid and have the, the, the inhabitants of Palestina wouldn't have sorrow take hold on them because of this nation of Israel that's brought, been brought out. Far the opposite, if they went through there, the nation of Israel would be afraid and would return to Egypt. So God said, I'm not going to take you through Palestine because it's, you're not ready for that yet. So this is talking about a time in the future, something else that will put sorrow on the inhabitants of Palestina. Verse 15, then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. And all the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. So if you look at, um, actually, some of us may have this. If you turn up the maps in the back of your Bible, um, in the, uh, the Oxford that I have, it's maps three and four. Uh, either one of those will work for this demonstration. Um, but what you're looking for, if you have a different publisher, is a map dealing with Israel 
in the time of Joshua, Samuel, David, Saul, those, that time period. And it will give us some locations of different nations as we look at this. Um, keep, I hope we're keeping our hands in Exodus 15 because we will pop back there quite quickly. So let's find the nations that we've talked about already. Uh, Palestina, or the land of the Philistines, on map 3, is on the right-hand page, or the bottom page, if you hold it in uh, portrait version. So it'll be uh, at approximately 5W. You'll see Philistines right on the shoreline of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Our next one would be the Dukes of Edom. We have that to the south, below the Dead Sea. We have Moab, which is to the east, of the Dead Sea. Then we have Canaan, which um, we could piece together some verses, but the Canaanites seem to have been, yes, the whole thing is called the land of Canaan because they're all sort of Canaanites, but those who are specifically called Canaanites seem to dwell farther to the north um, because they're the first ones that Abraham encounters as he comes into the land from the north. So we've got four cardinal compass points. We've got the west of the Philistines, the south of Edom, the east of Moab, and the north of Canaan. And that gives us a general area to the west of the Dead Sea. Now, Shiloh, um, if we can find Shiloh on this map, I don't know if I have it on this map. Um, Shiloh is X4. X4. Um, so it's, yeah, so just on the, um, the north part of the second page, um, you'll, you'll see Shechem right in the center with a red dot, and then straight below that you'll see Shiloh. So Shiloh's pretty fulfilling those characteristics. We have um, the east, northeast, southwest, all kind of filling the right uh, parameters to be Shiloh. But we know that God has already abandoned Shiloh as far as this, the time period of David is concerned. The ark is not there. God has said that that's, these things aren't going to be anymore. In fact, the, the title of our last class, My Place Which Was in Shiloh, comes from Jeremiah at the end of the time of Solomon's temple when he says, look back at my place which was in Shiloh and look what I did to it. And that's what's going to happen to this house because you've gone the same direction. So we have the general location picked. And then if we move on in Exodus chapter 15... We have in verse 17, Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Yahweh, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. That sounds like a very specific place. It's no longer just a general area that Shiloh seems to fall within the confines of. Now it's the mountain, the place, the sanctuary. So where would we think would be the place, the mountain of Yahweh's inheritance? Of course, looking back with it with hindsight, we know where to go for that. Well, that's obviously Zion. That's Mount Zion. Um, that's Jerusalem. We know that that's what is always addressed as Yahweh's mountain. But how would David know that? David isn't standing with our perspective, looking back with the wealth of Scripture before us and saying, well, there it all is. It's perfectly clear. He's sitting in the field, trying to remember what he's heard, what he's read, and trying to think about where is it supposed to be. The ark is in exile. It's abandoned by the people of Israel. No one is seeking after it to bring it back. Where is it supposed to go? Everywhere it's gone, it's caused calamity and death. It's obviously not supposed to be where it's been, But where is it supposed to be? Well, what would be the mountain of Yahweh's inheritance? Of course, we're confirmed later on with where that location is. But David himself, when he brings the ark into Jerusalem, doesn't know. He doesn't know where that location is. He knows it's supposed to be somewhere in the confines of Jerusalem. That this is the place. We see, going back into the patriarchs, we see um, Jacob purchasing land that was near Jerusalem, that uh, looked towards the towers of Jerusalem or of Salem at the time. We see uh, his grandfather going up onto Mount Moriah to offer Isaac, which would have been one of the mounts in the vicinity of Salem. 
We see much activity of the patriarchs in this area. And David knew that something had to happen here, that this had to be the location. It fit all the, the characteristics, but there's a specific location that God wants, and I don't know what it is yet. And for most of his life, he didn't know. Even long after 2 Samuel 7, when he's been told, you won't build the house, your son will, he still doesn't seem to have it pinpointed exactly where it's supposed to be. He knows what it's supposed to look like. He knows how to, how to put together all the materials that are necessary for it. But he doesn't know where to tell Solomon to start digging. Until we get to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. So just think about that. David would have been an old man by this point. 1 Chronicles 21, we're very near the end of his life. Very near the end of his life. He's long since been told not to go out to, to war with the nation. That they're afraid for his health because they can't protect him and he can't protect himself the way he could when he was a young man and a man of valor. So he's been told now he has to stay home. And he's nearing the end of his life. He's been making vast preparations for the temple, but he still doesn't know where to dig. Where is it supposed to be? I know it's supposed to be here somewhere, but I don't know where. And without getting into all the details um, of this, uh, this is a, a whole other consideration which we're probably somewhat familiar with, but I'm sure there's always more for us to consider. Uh, 1 Chronicles 21, we'll just go into it really quickly. Satan, in verse 1, stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And of course we know from the comparative record that it's actually Yahweh as Satan who is uh, stirring up against, uh, or standing up against Israel and provoking David because he had a judgment that he had to bring upon Israel. Um, so he goes through the numbering process. Um, the numbering process isn't completed before Joab returns because plague has been released on the nation. People are dying. Um, and at the, at the command of, of Yahweh, something was going to happen to punish the people. And David chose uh, three days uh, in the hand of Yahweh instead of in the hands of his enemies because of the mercy of Yahweh. And of course, as that plague comes to its completion, uh, if we take into the story at verse um, 14, perhaps. So Yahweh sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And we're not told about any of the other cities. But we're told in verse 15, God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. Not to utterly destroy it, but to destroy it through judgment. And as he was destroying, Yahweh beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, it is enough. He didn't change his mind in the sense that, oh, I never should have done that. But he said, this is enough. Stay now thine hand. But the angel doesn't disappear. The angel doesn't return to heaven, as it were. It stays there. It says, The angel of Yahweh stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David, from his house in Jerusalem, lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of Yahweh stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. And he's terrified because of the judgment that's going to come upon the city of God and he was in sackcloth and the elders of Israel and they fall on their faces and they and David says to God he in a sense he leads that small assembly of himself and the elders of Israel in prayer to God as he sees the judgments of Yahweh literally outside his window and he says to God is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed but as for these sheep Second Samuel 7, Yahweh tells David, I took thee from following after the sheep and made thee leader over my people Israel. And David still sees himself as a shepherd, not as a king. He sees himself as a shepherd. And he says, these sheep, these innocent ones that I am responsible for, what have they done? Now, of course, they had done something wrong and they were each responsible for their own sins. And Yahweh had occasion against them. 
which is why he stood up against Israel and provoked David to number them. But David, as the shepherd king, saw it as his responsibility to lead, and he hadn't been leading properly because his sheep had gone astray, and he hadn't done what he should have. So he took the responsibility on himself, and he says, Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Yahweh my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. So he takes the responsibility for the sins of his people. He calls down Yahweh to bring the punishment on him and his family, essentially saying, wipe out the promises of 2 Samuel 7 if it will save these people. Bring down your judgment upon me and my father's house, but not on thy people that they should be plagued. Because David's desire was still to see Yahweh dwell with his people and not to destroy them. So then in verse 18, the angel of Yahweh commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto Yahweh in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Can you think of half a dozen times that God has told someone to build an altar in a specific place to offer sacrifices? I couldn't. Outside of the confines of the temples and the tabernacle. I couldn't think of a half a dozen times even where God has said, build me an altar and offer sacrifices. There's times where we're told how to build an altar and what the altars should be and shouldn't be and that these people did build altars to Yahweh, but where God says to someone, pick this spot, build an altar for burnt offerings and offer sacrifices. And David goes, that's the spot. I've wondered where it's going to be I'm almost at the end of my life and God still hasn't revealed to me where it's supposed to be. And in the depths of despair, when he's willing to lay down his own life for his people, he figures it out. God says, build me an altar there and offer sacrifices. And David doesn't go up to the tabernacle. It says he didn't go up to the tabernacle because he was terrified of the, of, of the angel of Yahweh. And that's, that's forward in verse 29. Um, the tabernacle of Yahweh had made in the wilderness and the altar of the burnt offering were at that season in the high place at Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God for he was afraid because of the sword of the angel of Yahweh. So the last piece of the puzzle clicks into place for David. He now knows where to tell his son to dig. So he builds an altar. We're not sure what the material of the altar was, what it looked like. We know that he would not offer to Yahweh something that cost him nothing. So he paid the appropriate price for not just the animals and the instruments, but for the location as well. He buys the piece of land that the altar is to be put on. Interesting that he, as king, doesn't enforce his right. I'm king of this whole land. It's mine anyways. Just give it to me. He says, no, it has to cost me something. It has to cost me something to offer sacrifice to my God. So, well, I guess we'll, we'll jump into uh, 2 Samuel chapter 8 in our next class as we uh, continue looking at the traveling of the ark and specifically now looking at the labor of David having been given all that he needs now to prepare for the palace of Yahweh. I pray that we'll be able to see in our next class the, the great zeal and fervor that's rejuvenated in this old man who for quite some time had not even been able to get out of bed. But in these last few days of his life, resurfaces as a force in Israel to direct his people to serve Yahweh, that he might be able to build a palace for his God, and a resting place for the ark of his presence.